so today I'm going to talk about acquiring lexical semantic knowledge, uh, which is um, more or less a topic of uh, my, uh, my thesis. Um, and I'm going to start by explaining what I mean when I say lexical knowledge. Uh, so obviously lexical, so pertaining to words, uh, sometimes multi-word expressions, especially in the case of uh, uh, named entities with multiple words. Uh, and um, specifically, I'm interested in um, telling how these words relate to each other. Um, and this information can be helpful for many semantic applications uh, that need, need to deal with the lexical variability. So let's look at one example. Uh, in question answering, uh, if we ask the system, uh, when did Donald Trump visit in Alabama? Um, so the way these systems would work, they would uh, search the web for uh, text that have some lexical overlap with uh, the question and maybe have some uh, similar words to the words in the question. So uh, they may re retrieve uh, the following candidate passages. Uh, the first one is uh, Trump visited Huntsville on September 23rd. And the second is Trump visited Mississippi on June 21st. And we know that only the first one could be the correct answer uh, because we know that uh, Huntsville is in Alabama, but uh, Mississippi is not in Alabama, even though it's uh, close. Um, and so a system would also have to have this knowledge, which is one type of lexical knowledge uh, in order to answer the question correctly, uh, despite uh, the similarity between all these words. And this leads me to, um, to the next point, which is uh, word embeddings are not the solution for all the problems in the world. Um, so they provide semantic representation of words. And uh, probably, uh, I don't know, most NLP papers in the last five years have been using word embeddings, and um, usually with great success. Um, they contribute to, um, uh, to the performance of many applications. And um, they, could use in, they could be used in several ways. So they could either be uh, pre-trained or learned for the specific task, or, and then they can either be fixed or fine-tuned uh, during training. And um, it, it's not, I don't know if it's a common claim, but many people who don't work on lexical semantics would uh, think that this is sufficient for uh, any kind of lexical semantics you need into your um, the model for your end task. And I would like to um, argue um, and say that it's actually not, uh, not exactly correct. I, and I think that word embeddings are, in general, great in capturing general semantic relatedness. Uh, but they have a major problem uh, that they tend to mix all the different semantic relations together. And I'm going to show an illustration for that. Um, so what I did here is I took several famous texts. Uh, in this case, uh, specifically, it's the I Have a, a Dream speech from uh, Martin Luther King. It's a part of it. And I just replaced every noun in the text with uh, the most similar word to vec uh, word. And I got this uh, funny text. I have a daydream that my four little kids will one week live in a country where they will not be judged by their use of their epidermis, but by their classical dot com of their, prota their protagonist. <laughs> Uh, so it doesn't make much sense. Um, some of the replacements here are actually valid synonyms. Uh, so um, kids instead of children, country instead of nation, it's close enough. Uh, but we have a lot of other semantic relations here. So um, daydream is a hyponym of dream. It's, it's a specific type of dream, not necessarily what uh, uh, the original intention was. Um, week is a co-hyponym of they, it's they, they share a mutual hyperneme and they're actually mutually exclusive. Uh, so that's definitely not a good replacement. Um, classical.com is unrelated. I don't know, the, the original word was content. And protagonist is actually a valid, synony, a valid synonym of character, but not in this sense, but in the sense of uh, character in the book. Um, so I, I hope I, I illustrated that there, there is a problem. It's not perfect. Uh, we need to do better than that. And uh, in case you're interested, there are more examples in this URL and uh, also the code, you can play with it. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about two, uh, two works in, in this talk. Uh, one of them is uh, from two years ago um, about recognizing lexical semantic relations. And the other one is a new work uh, that I'm going to present in this ACL 
um, which is specifically about uh, interpreting noun compounds. Okay, so let's start with the recognizing lexical semantic relations. Um, so we first started with uh, focusing on the hypernomy relation. So um, this is a relation um, between two words. There is the more specific word, which is the hyponym. It's either a subclass of the hypernym, the more general word, or an instance of, of it. Uh, so um, for example, cat and animal. Cat is the hyponym, animal is the hypernym. This is a subclass of relation. And on the other hand, uh, Google and company, it's uh, an instance of relation. Uh, and we don't actually distinguish between these two uh, variants of uh, hypernomy. We, like most work, we treat this equally. And uh, the hypernomy detection task is basically just a binary classification task. So you, uh, the model gets two words, uh, x and y, and it needs to decide whether y is a hypernym of x. Uh, and also, the words are given without any context, so um, it should consider all the different senses that X and Y may have. So, for example, Apple can have as hypernym both fruit and company. So, um, previous methods for uh, hypernymy detection could be roughly divided into two main approaches, uh, path-based and distributional. I'm going to elaborate on each one of them. Uh, what we did in our work from uh, ACL 2016 uh, is uh, first we improve the path based representation, uh, of course, with neural models, and uh, then we um, integrated distributional information, uh, which is supposed to be complementary to the path based information, uh, into an integrated model that we call HypeNet. So uh, let's start with the prior methods, specifically the distributional approach. So um, this is in general for uh, recognizing any. Uh, semantic relation, lexical semantic relations uh, between words, not just specifically for hypernomy. Um, the idea behind this approach is to recognize the relation between the two words, X and Y, uh, based on their separate occurrences in the corpus. And when I say uh, separate occurrences, I basically mean uh, let's build a distributional representation for each one of the words, and then uh, use that to infer the relation between the words. Um, so. Uh, that's a very easy approach. You basically, you can just choose your favorite pre-trained embeddings, uh, and uh, you can, you, you train a classifier. Uh, usually it's just a linear classifier, uh, and uh, the classifier is based on some combination of the word embeddings, so most commonly concatenation or difference. And uh, it's also very fast to train. Um, and it works surprisingly well, uh, both on, um, a data set for hypernomy detection and also in the multi-class setting uh, to recognize multiple semantic uh, relations. Uh, but of course, it's not a solved task. Um, so um, it was pointed out three years ago by um, Levy et al. Uh, that there is a problem that they, they called uh, lexical memorization, uh, which is kind of an overfitting. It's not exactly the traditional uh, definition of overfitting because you get good performance on the test set. Uh, but th the idea is that uh, the, the models learn to memorize uh, specific words in the relation rather than looking at the relation between two words. Uh, so for example, if your training set contains a lot of examples like um, cat animal, dog animal, cow animal, and they're all labeled as hypernomy, then the model is eventually going to learn that any word X that appears with animal is a, is a hypernym pair, uh, regardless of X and its relation to animal. And then, of course, that if the, the test set contains uh, confusing examples, then you would get bad performance on the test set. But unfortunately, most, in most data sets, the, the test set, are, their distribu its distribution is very uh, similar to the training set, and then you get good performance. Um, and on the other hand, we have the other approach, which is uh, based on uh, a different uh, idea. Uh, and here the idea is to look at the joint occurrences of X and Y in the corpus and try to infer something about the relation uh, from the joint occurrences. So this started with the Hearst patterns uh, in 92. Um, these are uh, 12 patterns that um, when they connect two words, X and Y in the corpus, then they may indicate that Y is a hypernym of X. So here are a few examples, X or other Y, X is a Y, Y including X. Uh, I find it easy to just assign uh, words to that to see that it works. So for example, cats or other animals, cat is an animal, uh, animals including cats. Uh, and 
uh, in follow-up works, uh, rather than using textual patterns, um, uh, the, they, they use the dependency paths between the words. So this is more informative, uh, both because it removes some redundant information along the path, like this determiner is not very important, and also because uh, we get the information about the dependency labels. And in uh, 2004, there was a um, method by uh, Snow et al., um, which is a logistic regression classifier that's based on these dependency paths as sparse features. So let's say that this is the feature vector representing um, cat and animal. Uh, then um, every coordinate in the vector corresponds to some dependency path that connected two nouns in the corpus. Uh, so it's a very uh, high dimensional vector. And um, so cats and other animals were found 58 times in the corpus. Um, so this method uh, was uh, pretty successful. Uh, they, they managed to improve performance uh, upon just using Hurst patterns. And uh, one nice thing about this method is that it's actually um, very easily interpretable. So if you just look at the, so each path is a separate feature. So if you look at the feature weights that the classifier assigned to each feature, uh, and you take the most, the highest scoring ones, then you get the, the paths with, which are most indicative of hypernomy. And, and they showed in the paper that um, these paths include uh, all of Hurst patterns and, and more. Um, so of course there are some issues with this method and I'm going to focus on one of them, which is the issue that we were trying to, we, we were addressing, uh, and that's the sparsity of the feature space. Uh, so um, let's say that you have these semantic semantically similar paths, like uh, X inc is a Y, X group is a Y, and X organization is a Y. And um, you would have to observe each one of them uh, enough times in the corpus to learn that they are indicative of hypernomy. Uh, even though they are all similar to each other, they don't share any information. Uh, so there was an attempt to solve this, uh, this problem uh, by the PATI system. Uh, it's a um, system for taxonomy creation. Uh, and um, they, uh, among other things, they also needed to recognize semantic relations between uh, pairs of words, and they did that based on dependency paths. Uh, so they tried to generalize the path by replacing a word along the path with either its uh, part of speech tag, as here, uh, incorporation becomes noun, or a uh, wildcard. Uh, and uh, they managed to improve performance, uh, but um, it's still not perfect because um, Let's say that, for example, you would want to generalize these two uh, semantic, uh, semantically similar paths, like x is defined as y and x is described as y. They mean pretty much the same. Uh, you could do that via the x is verb as y, but then you may overgeneralize, and then you can include also um, negative paths like x is rejected as y. Uh, so this syntactic generalization is not, not yet good enough, and uh, we were looking for a more uh, semantic generalization. Um, so this is our, our work now. Um, we started by improving the path representation. Um, so this is what uh, the dependency path looks like. Uh, we um, represent it by first splitting each path to edges, uh, so that each edge consists of four components. Um, the uh, dependent lemma, as in B, the dependent part of speech tag, the dependency label and the edge direction, whether it's going up, down, or if it's in the root, then uh, it's a special uh, direction. And we, we, have, we, we learn different uh, embeddings for each one of these components. Uh, so the lemma embeddings are initialized with uh, pre-trained glove embeddings, and the other embeddings are just initialized randomly. Uh, they have far less uh, values than the lemma embeddings, so it's easy to learn them. And uh, to represent an edge, we simply concatenate all, the, all, the, um, all its component vectors. Uh, to represent uh, the entire dependency path, we feed the edges sequentially uh, to an LSTM, and we take the last output vector as the path embedding. So eventually, our goal is to classify uh, pairs of words, and uh, these words usually appear in the corpus in more than one uh, dependency path. Uh, so what we do is uh, we encode each path separately using the LSTM, and uh, to represent the word pair, we uh, average over all the path embeddings, uh, weighted by their frequency. Uh, so this is the first variant of the network. In this variant, um, 
we classify uh, the, the word pairs based only on their path-based information. So this uh, path average path embedding is a feature vector representing the word pairs. And uh, we fit it into an MLP and predict uh, binary classification, hypernomy or not. Um, so the second step was to integrate dis distributional information, which uh, we already knew is supposed to be com uh, complementary to the path-based information. Uh, we did that very simply by just uh, concatenating X and Y's word embeddings to the average path. Uh, and this becomes the new feature vector representing X and Y. Again, we uh, feed it to the MLP and uh, predict hypernomy. So uh, we trained and evaluated the method on a new data set that we constructed from uh, knowledge resources. Um, basically, we, we needed a large data set and the uh, available ones were uh, too small. Um, so the first results are a comparison between the path-based variant of our network with the path-based baselines. Um, so SNOW is the original method from uh, SNOW et al, the logistic regression classifier with the uh, sparse uh, path features. Um, SNOW plus GEN is uh, the same classifier. It's, it's our re-implementation. Uh, same classifier, but we also allowed uh, generalized paths like in the uh, PATI algorithm. Uh, and uh, we can see that our uh, that HypeNet uh, outperformed the, the baselines by a, a large improvement in recall. Um, when compared to the, the separate path-based and distributional methods, um, we also see that the integrated method uh, out, um, substantially outperforms the, the individual methods, uh, showing that this information is indeed complementary. So um, we wanted to analyze what our network actually learned, and specifically we were interested in uh, identifying the uh, paths which are most indicative of hypernomy. So as I said before, uh, in, the, um, in the baselines, it's pretty straightforward. You just look at the uh, feature weights from the classifier, and you take the highest scoring ones. So it was uh, a bit less straightforward uh, uh, to do that for HypeNet. Uh, but we measured the path contribution to positive classification by uh, taking each of the dependency paths in the corpus and um, just uh, treating them as a pseudo word pair that appeared once in this dependency path and using the zero vectors as the um, word embeddings of X and Y. And uh, we um, look at the, at the score that the classifier assigned to the hypernomy class and uh, rank these paths according to, the, to this score. So what we found is that the original method uh, found several uh, specific um, and good paths for which are indicative of hypernomy, like for example, uh, X company is a Y and X LTD is a Y. Is, is a y. Um, and when we added the generalizations, then uh, we got some uh, more general, more general, but possibly also more noisy paths like uh, X noun is a Y. And um, in HypeNet, we found multiple uh, various dependency paths that were very similar to the uh, common ones, um, like X association is a Y, X co is a Y, X corporation is a Y, and so on. And uh, some of these were actually not very frequent in the corpus. They were just similar to the, semantically similar to the frequent paths. OK, so um, it was uh, very straightforward to extend that to multiple semantic relations. Uh, we did that. We basically just uh, changed the, the output vector uh, from two relations to k relations, for where k is the number of relations in the data set. Uh, we call that LexNet, just because it's not for hypernomy anymore, but it's basically the same, uh, the same uh, algorithm. Uh, but we did do some uh, interesting analysis um, to find out what this network is capable of learning. Um, so we um, evaluated it on uh, four d different data sets for uh, multiple semantic relations. And what we found is that, um, first of all, uh, LexNet always performs better than each individual uh, method, path-based or distributional. Uh, in some cases, the gap between LexNet and the best distributional method is pretty small. Uh, and it's, it usually happens because of the lexical memorization issue. If you, uh, if you allow your uh, method to just memorize words, then it's very difficult to improve the performance upon that. Uh, when, in some cases, the, the gap was um, 
was larger, uh, specifically uh, when we uh, don't allow lexical memorization. So there was a suggestion in the original paper um, by Levi et al. Uh, to split the training test and validation set um, to, to have a distinct vocabulary. And then uh, if the model, the distributional model, memorizes specific words, then it doesn't help it uh, during test time and you get uh, much worse performance. So in these cases, um, our, the integrated method uh, is substantially better than the distributional one. Uh, in some other cases as well, so if one of the words is polysimus, uh, and the relation between the words is in the less common sense of one of the words. So uh, for example, uh, in one of the data sets, we had a, a meronymy relation between piano and key, because piano contains keys. Uh, but the distributional model just classified them as unrelated. Uh, and this is be probably because uh, the, the most common sense of uh, key is uh, door key, and, and this is reflected in its word embedding. Um, and, and then if you try to classify uh, based on the word embedding, this is what you get. Uh, but if these two words appear together in a sentence, then it's very likely that um, they appear in the sense of uh, key, which is related to piano. So you kind of get a um, free disambiguation here. Um, similarly, if the relation is not prototypical, um, so yeah, I like using this um, this uh, example because I, I didn't cherry pick that; it just uh, appeared during the error analysis. Um, so um, there was a, an event relation in one of the data sets, and uh, it's usually it, con it connects uh, a noun with a verb that that uh, is some event related to that noun. So uh, peak is an event related to cherries, but they're just too far apart in the embedding space. So uh, again, the distributional um, baseline failed to classify them. And uh, the, the path based, the, the integrated uh, model succeeded because they appeared together in a sentence that seemed to be uh, indicative of the event relation. And finally, if uh, one or both of the words are rare, uh, then we know that rare words have uh, low quality word embeddings because you need a lot of um, statistics about them to get a, a good representation. Um, and of course, if two words are rare, then the likelihood that they would appear together in a sentence is very low. Uh, but sometimes that happens, as in this case. And uh, when that happens, it's actually enough to have one uh, meaningful uh, sentence describing the relation in order to classify them correctly. OK, so that was the first part. And now I'm going to move on to uh, new work, which is about interpreting noun compounds. OK, so um, let's start with uh, some uh, definitions and motivations. Uh, so in noun compounds, we have um, some implicit semantic relation between the words uh, that the noun compound uh, is, uh, consists of. Um, the, there is a head noun and there are uh, modifiers. Uh, the S is in brackets here because I'm, I focus specifically on two word noun compounds, but as, as in most previous work, but it could have multiple <coughs> modifiers. So here, here are some examples. Um, apple cake, for example, is a cake made of apples. That's one semantic relation. And on the other, on the other hand, uh, birthday cake is a cake eaten on a birthday. So um, same head. Uh, different modifier and different semantic relation between the head and the modifier. Uh, and there is this really nice definition from uh, Nakov. Um, he called the um, noun compounds uh, text compression devices, uh, where you can actually say more with less words. And um, I actually think that we are we as humans are pretty good in decompressing them. Um, so here's an example. Uh, this is just an image I took off the web, five kid sandwich ideas. Um, as you can see, there are no kids in the ingredients. And uh, I, I assume that no one would ask what goes well with a kid in a sandwich, uh, because we can easily interpret that this is a sandwich for kids. Um, this goes also for uh, new or unknown noun compounds. So in general, noun compounds are very common in English. Uh, but many of them are actually not very frequent in corpora. So if you try to uh, develop a model that's uh, based on some distributional representation of the entire noun compound in a corpora, it's, 
it's difficult to get uh, good performance. And again, this is, uh, so this is basically just my observation. It's not backed up by any studies, but I, I feel like we're pretty good in uh, interpreting unseen noun compounds that we've never uh, observed before. So uh, here's another example, uh, parsley cake. I don't know if you've heard of that. I've heard of that a few years ago. Um, it's, it could mean a lot of things. Uh, for example, we could think that, uh, as in the left image, we could think that it's a cake with or from parsley. And we could also think that, uh, for some reason, it's a cake for parsley, as in the right image. And this is obviously ridiculous, and we can easily think, uh, know that uh, the left image is the correct one. Uh, and um, we, do the, we do that even without um, uh, ever observing this noun compound before. Um, so what I think happens is uh, that we try to generalize our uh, existing knowledge. Uh, so we can ask ourselves, okay, wh what can cake be made of? Uh, and then this is just a um, screenshot from a corpus search, but we could uh, just have think the same, um, the same thing in, from what we know. Uh, so I think it's hard to see from here, but um, uh, the, the, um, it says cake with something, and then um, the distribution is, uh, you, you get a lot of uh, chocolate, lemon, strawberries, candles, caramel, frosting, vanilla, berries, eggs, and so on. And so you get a lot of food uh, ingredients and uh, many fruit. Uh, and you can see that, okay, parsley sort of fits into this distribution, then probably this is a cake made of parsley or cake with parsley. Uh, and this is similar to uh, selection of preferences. Okay, so this is about how I think we uh, interpret new noun compounds. Um, I think we also need computers to interpret noun compounds. I don't know if I need to convince anyone um, in that, but uh, here's an example. Uh, so this is actually an example for a successful interpretation, but of a very simple noun compound. So I just used the Google Assistant and I asked it to um, create a morning meeting and it added in an event to my, uh, my calendar uh, whose, um, uh, on the next day whose uh, time is the morning. Uh, so I think it's pretty easy because morning is usually a time modifier. There. I, think I can think of maybe one or two examples in which uh, it's a part of a, like in morning glory or something like that, that it's not a time modifier, but in most cases it's pretty safe to assume that um, it means a, a meeting in the morning. Uh, but of course there are more uh, complex examples and we need um, computers to be able to interpret noun compounds. So uh, there are um, various tasks for uh, noun compound interpretation. Uh, I'm going to focus on one of them, which is the uh, noun compound paraphrasing. Uh, but uh, in the paper that I'm going to discuss, we also have uh, evaluation on noun compound classification. And I also have a paper at NACL about noun compound classification. Uh, and uh, also we have a discussion about compositionality prediction. So if you, you're interested in noun compounds, there, there is more, you can uh, read the papers. So um, the paraphrasing approach uh, simply uh, says, uh, let's express the relation between the head and the modifier uh, in a, an explicit way. Uh, by paraphrasing it uh, to multiple prepositional and verbal paraphrases. Uh, so for example, uh, olive oil could be oil extracted from olives, or made of olives, or from olives, and so on. And uh, we evaluated on a, uh, we used a semival task from five years ago, uh, which is uh, defined slightly differently. Um, so uh, systems get a list of noun compounds, and for each one of the noun compounds, they need to extract paraphrases from free text, as many as they, they want. And uh, they also need to rank them. So this is a ranking task. And uh, it's evaluated against um, uh, correla for correlation with the human judgments. So basically what they did, they uh, crowdsourced the paraphrases. And then they um, scored each paraphrase by the number of annotators that suggested it. Um, so in order to do well on this task, you need to uh, retrieve as many paraphrases as possible, and you need to somehow rank them by how many people would uh, suggest this paraphrase. Um, I actually don't like this uh, setting. I, I would have preferred if it would have been just a retrieval task, but that's the way it's defined. 
Um, so um, there are not so many uh, methods for that, actually. Uh, there are three uh, participants in the semival task, and there has been some work afterwards, but they did not evaluate on the same uh, data set. Uh, in all these works, um, the, it's based on the corpus occurrences of the constituents of the noun compound. So for example, if you try to interpret apple cake, then you may uh, see something like cake made of apples in the corpus, and you can use that. And uh, specifically, all the semival task participants uh, used Google engrams as the corpus. So um, there are two problems which are related to each other. Um, first of all, many of the noun compounds may not have any paraphrases in the corpus. So that could either be because um, it's a very uh, infrequent noun compound, or on the other hand, maybe it's, it's so trivial that you wouldn't find any paraphrases of that. Like, for example, something like olive oil that uh, everyone knows what it is, then you may not find uh, an explanation to that. You may not find um, oil made of olives. And um, the second problem is related to that. Uh, for some noun compound, you would only uh, find very few paraphrases. And you need to retrieve more than, more than just a few. Uh, you, would you would want the model to, um, to be able to extract more semantically similar paraphrases. So for example, if you see uh, w2 extract, extracted from w1, you would also want to, um, to extract, to retrieve um, w2 made from, of w1. So um, previous methods have partial solutions to either one of the problems, but not to both of them. Um, so this is the, um, uh, the melody system. Um, they address the first problem uh, pretty much in the same way that, uh, similarly to how uh, we did that. Um, so they uh, represented each noun compound as a compositional vector. So uh, you, they, they learn some function, and, and then they, uh, they take the distributional representation of uh, W1, distributional representation of W2, so apple and cake, and they apply the function uh, on this, um, these two uh, vectors, and they get a new vector that represents apple cake. Uh, there are various way, ways to learn this function. Usually it's uh, by, um, trying to make it uh, similar to the observed uh, noun compound vector. Um, so the, the, the good thing about this method is that, that then if you get a new noun compound that you didn't observe during training, like for example, pear tart, then you can expect it to have a pretty similar vector to apple cake. And uh, when you use that to, um, to uh, predict the paraphrases, th uh, then you get similar paraphrases to the ones from apple cake. Uh, so that's that's pretty um, that's a good solution for the first problem. Um, the second problem is um, the solutions are a bit weaker. Um, so Sultani et al. Uh, they learned easier relations between um, paraphrases based on the noun compounds that appeared with each paraphrases. So for example, if a subset of the noun compounds that appeared with uh, W2 made of W1 also appeared in W2 extracted from W1. Uh, then you can assume that this is a subtype of, of that, that W2 extracted from W1 is a subtype of W2 made of W1. Uh, what we try to do is a uh, multitask learning that, uh, address, that tries to address uh, both problems at the same time. So uh, the previous approaches, they uh, focused on the main task, which is uh, given a noun compound, predicting a paraphrase. And uh, in our case, it's a multitask learning problem. So this is what a training example looks like. It has three components, uh, the two constituents of the noun compound. So for example, apple and cake, and one paraphrase, uh, as in W2 made of W1. Um, if we have more than one paraphrase for the same noun compound, we just split it, in, split it into um, different uh, training examples. Um, so we have three subtasks. Uh, the main task is, um, predicting the paraphrase P given the noun compound W1, W2, which is essentially like answering the question, what's the relation between apple and cake? Um, our first helper task is to predict W1 given the paraphrase P and uh, the, the constituent W2. So this is like answering the question, what can cake be made of? And similarly, uh, we also try to predict W2 given the paraphrase and W1. So this is like answering the question, what can be made of apples? So uh, this is what the main task looks like. Um, so here we try to uh, answer the question, what's the relation between apple and cake? Uh, so 
we start we we try to predict some templated paraphrase and um, in in our empirically in our data it's always it always starts with w2 and something and w1 and that's probably because um, w2 is the head noun and so it's always head noun that something modifier um, so this is how we construct our missing paraphrase we um, uh, so we have cake p uh, some placeholder apple and we uh, encode that using a bile stm and uh, we take the output vector of the where the placeholder uh, is and uh, we fit it to an mlp and the mlp tries to predict an index to the paraphrase vocabulary so we have a we just have all the paraphrases that, that we saw in the corpus, the, par the templated paraphrases with W2 and W1, and we just try to predict existing uh, paraphrases. We don't yet generate new ones. It's, that's for future work. Um, so the, the green uh, embedding, the green vectors are uh, fixed word embeddings, specifically uh, 100 dimensional uh, dimensional glove embeddings, and the orange ones are uh, learned uh, placeholder embeddings. Uh, for the three um, uh, components, W1, W2, and P. Um, so, so this task uh, is similar to, in some way, similar to the melody system. It uh, can generalize for uh, similar noun compounds. So again, if we get uh, paired out, which we haven't observed during training, then we would encode it very similarly to apple cake, and uh, we can expect it to yield the same paraphrases. So this is uh, one of the helper tasks. The other one is just similar. Um, so here we try to predict W1. So what can cake be made of? Again, we uh, encode this uh, missing paraphrase, cake made of W1, uh, and we using the same bile STM. And uh, we take the output vector of uh, the W1 placeholder, and we fit it to a, another MLP that predicts an index in the word vocabulary. Um, so with respect to uh, parameters and the uh, by LSTM the, and the two kinds of embeddings are shared between the three subtasks and um, um, the MLP that predicts uh, word uh, is shared between the two helper tasks. So this is uh, helpful in generalizing the similar paraphrases. Um, so paraphrases could be similar um, with, in two aspects. First, they could be lexically similar. So if I uh, encode cake is made of W1 instead of cake made of W1, uh, it's, it would have a similar um, encoding because they are similar. And, um, simil and in the other, on the other hand, we could also have similarity between paraphrases uh, based on uh, the noun compounds that they uh, appear with. So uh, for example, um, cake containing W1 uh, would have a similar representation because uh, we um, train it to, to um, predict the same word, which is apple. So we also use Google engrams as a uh, training data. And uh, our, our method is semi-supervised, so we start with a, a list of noun compounds, uh, not just from the semi training data, because it's pretty small, uh, so from several um, noun compound data sets. And um, with respect to the Semival training data, we only use it for, uh, to, to um, get templates of possible paraphrases uh, with respect to the part of speech tags. So for example, we can tell that W2, verb proposition W1, is a uh, is re reasonable paraphrase. That helps us uh, reducing the training data and focusing only on the uh, paraphrases which are, which are likely to be correct. Uh, we also uh, weight our training examples. So um, the most natural thing to do would be to, uh, um, to, to assign weights based on the frequency in Google engrams. Uh, but that's a bit problematic. It was also pointed out in previous work uh, that it, um, it would rank the, it would assign much higher scores to the very short and common uh, paraphrases, uh, especially the prepositional paraphrases. So for example, W2 of W1 or W2 for W1 would be uh, assign the highest weights for all the um, for all the training examples. Uh, so we address that by um, uh, normalizing the weighting uh, for each paraphrase length separately. So um, we also get some verbal paraphrases uh, which are assigned high weights. Um, we end up with a, a, around a 
140k instances. So uh, we have two evaluations in the paper. I'm only going to focus on the uh, main evaluation, which is the paraphrasing. Um, so as I said before, the stem eval task is a ranking task. Our model um, predicts uh, confidence scores, but there's no um, reason to assume that these confidence scores would uh, correlate with the human judges. Um, so we have uh, another component. Uh, we predict the top k paraphrases for each noun compound. I think k is 250 in this evaluation. Um, and then we learn to re-rank them. Um, so the, the goal is to correlate with human judgments. So we have a, an SVM pay, pairwise uh, ranking model. Uh, basically, we just for each noun compound, we take each two paraphrases, and this is a binary classification task. We just try to predict whether the first paraphrase should be ranked higher or the second. And it's based on pretty shallow features, like the part of speech tags in the paraphrase, uh, prepositions in the paraphrase, how long it is, and whether it ends with a special W1 symbol or with an, another word, and uh, the, the outputs from the original model, so uh, the similarity to the first predicted paraphrase and the confidence score. So here are the results. Uh, we compared with the three semival participa test participants and with our, with our baseline. Um, there are two evaluation settings, the isomorphic and the non-isomorphic. Uh, the isomorphic one is the more interesting one, uh, which rewards, so uh, I didn't say that before, but there is a scorer uh, in this task, so it's not a standard evaluation, you just run some, um, uh, some code that uh, gives you a score, and you, then you can compare it to the other uh, uh, models, and uh, it reports these two scores, the isomorphic and non-isomorphic. It's based on um, n-gram overlap, overlap, and um, it also treats uh, determiners and uh, some other words differently. So it's, it's a very special uh, evaluation metric. It's not anything standard. Um, so in the isomorphic setting, um, the systems are expected to, uh, to uh, retrieve as many uh, paraphrases as possible, and pretty much in the same order. Uh, so it's a pretty difficult uh, evaluation metric. And on the other hand, the non-isomorphic one uh, rewards only precision. So uh, it expects the systems to uh, predict the higher uh, rank ranked uh, paraphrases and doesn't care about the order. So um, as you can see, there are two uh, baselines that perform very well on the non-isomorphic setting, but poorly on the isomorphic one. Uh, that, that's just to show that the non-isomorphic setting is actually not very interesting. Uh, and uh, these two models are pretty conservative, so they would just uh, predict very few paraphrases and very uh, few and common paraphrases. So they don't, don't get a lot of uh, errors, but they also don't get a lot of uh, recall. Um, so um, the stem eval baseline is very simple, actually. It's j it just predicts uh, only propositional paraphrases and always in the same uh, arbitrary fixed order. So for example, always W2 of W1, W2 for W1, in, at. Uh, so it's not a very uh, sophisticated baseline, and it still achieves 40 points on the uh, non-isomorphic setting. Um, so we outperform uh, all the methods on the isomorphic setting, and um, we outperform the, the two systems that balance between recall and precision, also on the non-isomorphic setting, but uh, we can't beat the, the baselines that, the, the, the methods that um, aim good precision. So uh, we did some error analysis. Uh, so first, with respect to false positives, these are uh, paraphrases that our, um, uh, our model uh, predicted, which were not in the gold standard. Uh, so actually, 44% of them were valid paraphrases uh, that were just missing from the gold standard, which is quite reasonable because the gold standard is obviously not, uh, not uh, exhaustive. 15% uh, of them were too specific. So uh, for example, we had the noun compound community life. So our model predicted uh, life in community or life of community. Uh, but it also predicted life of women in community, which is just too specific. Uh, we had 14% of uh, incorrect propositions. It's usually just paraphrases that are um, very common, like, um, like I said before, W2 of W1 or from W1. Uh, and I think that in, in part, it, if, if you look at the training data, you see that the training data already contains these errors. 
So we would have some things that don't make sense, like you could have something like oil from baby. And uh, that happens, I, I guess this happens because of the Google engrams, the, the nature of this corpus, uh, which doesn't respect the, the syntactic structure of the sentence. So uh, for example, you could think of a sentence like, uh, rinse away the oil from the baby's head. Uh, and in this sentence, you have an engram that says oil from baby. So we would have the, this in the training examples. That, that's a problem. Uh, we also have 8% eight, eight, uh, of syntactic errors and 5% um, of uh, borderline grammatical uh, um, paraphrases. It's like, it's not exactly incorrect, it just doesn't sound very good, like force of coalition forces, and 14% of other errors. So with respect to false negatives, uh, so these are paraphrases from the gold standard that our model did not predict at all. 30% uh, of them are just uh, too long for our model. So uh, we were constrained um, by five words because we used Google engrams. And 30% um, of the, um, of the um, paraphrases in the gold standard were too long, were, were much longer than that. Um, we also had 25% of uh, paraphrases with determiners. Uh, we conflated the similar par uh, paraphrases by removing the determiners and the adjectives, which was probably beneficial, but we, we also got this 25% error on, um, so our model would predict mutation of gene instead of mutation of a, a gene. And 10% uh, uh, with inflected constituents. So uh, we always, always use just the lemma form of the two constituents. Uh, so we would predict holding of share for shareholding, uh, while the gold standard contained uh, holding of shares. And 35% uh, of other errors. OK, so uh, to recap, I presented uh, two tasks for recognizing semantic relations between nouns, um, which were different uh, in two aspects. So one of them is between arbitrary uh, words, specifically uh, nouns. And uh, the other one is between constituents of a noun compound in the context of the noun compound. Uh, they were also framed differently. So one of them is a classification task to ontological relations. And the other one is free text paraphrasing. Uh, but I think the main takeout from uh, both works is that um, when we integrate features uh, based on joint corpus occurrences, we can improve performance, especially on the uh, more challenging evaluation settings. And, um, and I think that means that uh, word embeddings are a useful tool, as, as they were also used in these models, but it's not the only one. And uh, you should always consider using uh, more uh, information sources. Yeah, And I, I replace these words uh, again with uh, <laughs> the, mo the most similar words in the word to vec. Thank you.